The Total War series has been around for a while, and it's had its share of highs and lows, but Warhammer 3 is an absolute high. Which feels strange to say, because only a few months ago this same game seemed to represent a new low. Now, if you don't know much about this series, that might sound a little confusing, but hey, welcome to Total War. No one ever said these games were simple. I mean, for starters, they're a bit like two different games rolled into one, with both a turn-based 4X-like strategy game that plays on a zoomed-out campaign map, alongside real-time strategy battles that can play out in deliciously zoomed-in detail, and both of these have their share of depth. Then you have the fact that the Total War fanbase seems to be stuck in a never-ending civil war between history and fantasy fans, or traditionalists versus modern fans, where it can seem like the more people enjoy the modern entries, the more others claim the series to be dead or ruined, making it a bit hard to gauge what's really going on and whether a new title is actually worth checking out. And then there's also the fact that to play Warhammer 3, the good Warhammer 3 at least, you also need to own two more games, Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2, and outside of sales, they're both still at or near full price, which might make jumping into Warhammer 3 a little off-putting. So, given this complicated nature and the unusually daunting barrier to entry, you might be tempted to just give this game a miss. But you shouldn't, because Total War Warhammer 3 is one of the best strategy games in years, maybe even decades. It is an incredible attempt at bringing the world of Warhammer to life, and in its current form it has so much content with such strong replayability and so many enjoyable qualities that it can effortlessly provide hundreds of hours of entertainment and still leave you wanting more. It is deep, varied, visually spectacular and absolutely addictive, but don't just take my word for it. As of me writing this right now, Steam says I have played this game for 195 hours in the last two weeks, which translates to just under 14 hours of playtime a day. And you should know that not only do I have no regrets for how I chose to spend the last two weeks of my life, but also that I would be happy to spend the next two weeks doing the exact same if I didn't have a YouTube channel to try to maintain and certain other deadlines. Speaking of which, this video is sponsored by NordVPN. Secure your internet connection and easily safeguard yourself from threats online with NordVPN, all while gaining a whole host of other benefits, like being able to connect to different game servers around the world with just the click of a button to find the fastest connections, or avoiding those annoying online geo restrictions stopping you from accessing your favorite games, deals, or servers. And right now, you can get four months free on all two-year plans by using my promo code or following the link below. And with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee, it's completely risk-free. So remember, you're not just lowering your latency for raids in Wrath of the Lich King Classic, you're also protecting your data online. That means it's basically a business investment, probably tax-deductible even, don't hold me to that. So, support the channel and buy NordVPN by visiting the link on screen or down below, and otherwise, let's talk Total War. To understand Total War, you need to understand how these games are greater than the sum of their parts, but you can't do that if you don't know what the parts are. So, part one. Have you ever seen a child playing with some toys and they're just like smashing their two toys together as a crude simulation of a battle? This is part one. Except instead of smashing inert plastic action figures together, you instead smash entire armies and they are not inert. They swing and stab and scream and go flying and run away. And as far as battle simulations go, it's pretty impressive, particularly when you add in some of the more unique creatures from Warhammer. Now, when playing these games, you may spend most of your time too zoomed out to fully appreciate this quality, but it does still add to the experience to always have that option to zoom in and see what's actually happening in real time, 
both due to the authenticity it adds to the gameplay and because it just looks really good. The Total War series has always impressed in this way. In fact, in the early 2000s, they actually made a historical TV show called Time Commanders that aired in the UK, where they just played Rome Total War. Except they never mentioned it was a video game and instead pretended it was some advanced historical simulation where they recreated famous battles and then had groups of contestants come on to shout out commands and pretend to be generals. Andy, I've got a unit of archers and a unit of cavalry in front of those. OK, so two protect cavalry, them. One infantry, one archers total. OK, get them protected. Get As protected. we go up, you've got spearmen ahead. Don't and engage archers. the spearmen on a charge because they've got huge spears. It was actually a little weird now that I look back at it. They even had real military historians commenting on people's strategies, which kind of makes me wish someone had put Legend of Total War in there to see what the historians would have to say about his playstyle. Anyway, I digress. The point is, the battle simulation side of Rome Total War looked so good they made a TV show out of it, and the Total War series has maintained its high quality visuals ever since. This puts Total War in a rather unique position, because while lots of strategy games do have some kind of visual representation to match their action, very few do it in a realistic way, and even if other games wanted to copy this approach, most developers would likely still struggle to find the budget to match these games in terms of scale, animation quality, and level of detail. So, if there is still a child inside of you that just wants to smash two toys together and see what happens, or if you just appreciate visually realistic simulations of big battles, Total War is basically unrivaled. Still, there is of course gameplay behind these visuals, and that brings us to part two. Now, depending on who you watch play, Total War's battles can seem anywhere between calm, mostly cinematic affairs, which basically play themselves, to micro-intensive high APM sweatfests. I think the best way to actually describe the gameplay is in three levels of complexity that players can engage with. Level one would be controlling your army. In theory, this is simple. In practice, I have introduced a few different people to the Total War series over the years, and I have been consistently impressed by how much some people struggle with moving their army from one side of the map to the other. There is actually more you need to do than just moving your army, so seeing people fail at this first hurdle is a little alarming. Anyway, you can move multiple units in different ways. You can alt-drag, make separate control groups, make one locked group, shift-click the unit bar, drag and select units on the battlefield with your mouse, you know, whatever works for you. But if you do select everything all at once and then right-click them to move, your beautiful pre-arranged formation might crumble before your eyes as you march your men straight into a bad time. So, you do have to develop a little bit of familiarity with the controls to at least get to the point where you can move in formation, charge in your infantry, make sure your ranged units are protected and firing at something, and get your cavalry or cavalry substitutes to flank in and sandwich the enemy or harass their backline. You know, easy stuff. In theory. But that's level one, mastering the controls. Level two, then, is mastering matchups. You see, behind the formations and flashy animations, the battlefield is really one big game of rock, paper, scissors, and if you want victory to be yours, you need to make sure your rocks are attacking the enemy's scissors and are protected from their papers, because their papers actually look like this. Now, sometimes this is simple. For example, units like spearmen have an anti-large bonus, meaning they're good at fighting large enemies like cavalry or monsters. So you might want to order your spearmen to attack the enemy large units. Or, even better, you might position your anti-large on your flank so they can intercept the enemy's cavalry when they're sent in to harass your back line. Armor and armor piercing are likewise easy to understand, but some other traits can be less obvious, like using fire damage to counter regeneration, or using magic against units with high physical resist. Also, sometimes matchups are not based on specific traits, but rather a unit's core statistics. 
For example, units with high melee defense and leadership might be perfect for holding the front line where the fighting is thickest, whereas your low defense, high damage dealers might fare best in easier matchups where they can quickly overwhelm their foes. The enemy then also has their own agenda to further complicate all this, but the part of Warhammer Total War games that really makes them stand out is that they include so many different variables and buffs and traits that come from the vastly different units and factions that the simple concept of creating good matchups can become very complex. I mean, smashing a rock into some scissors is simple, but you're typically commanding an army of 20 varied units going up against the same, and this creates a lot to consider. You need to worry about unit health, leadership and individual traits, as well as army formations, terrain and battle maneuvers, alongside the more micro-intensive aspects like using magic, activating buffs, cycle charging cavalry, smashing through with chariots, and on it goes. The result is a lot of depth that is satisfying to learn and to master, and yet despite all this complexity, Warhammer 3 actually makes understanding it easier than in the past, thanks to detailed tooltips that display a range of important information. For example, if you want to quickly work out what went wrong or right, then you can look at the damage dealt by individual units to see exactly where a battle is being won or lost. So, this complicated game of matchups is the second level of combat. The third level then comes from the battle realism option, which limits the player's visibility while removing the option to pause or slow down combat. This makes the gameplay more similar to other real-time strategy games, where the skill is as much in knowing what to do as it is in being able to do it in real time amidst the chaos of battle. Here, you might need to sacrifice certain matchups and microing potential to instead prioritize the things which are the most important as you may not have time to manage every little detail, and so this creates a sense of pressure and urgency that changes the feel of the gameplay while deepening the skill cap. The thing is, battle realism is completely optional, so if players don't want to ever engage with this type of real-time challenge, they don't have to. And really, all three levels of Total War's gameplay can function both independently or simultaneously, depending on the experience the player wants out of the game. For example, if you have no interest in RTS-like gameplay and just want to enjoy other aspects of the series, you can set the difficulty relatively low and then just charge your army in while zooming in to watch the ensuing carnage. Or, if you want to min-max absolutely everything without being under severe time restraints, you can set the difficulty high, but keep battle realism off, and then take your time pausing during battles to min-max and micromanage as much as you want. Or if you do in fact want a fast-paced RTS-like experience, but think numbers are for nerds, you could even set the difficulty to a medium level with battle realism turned on, and then have battles be decided by your ability to maneuver units and perform in real time, rather than your understanding of numbers and modifiers. The point is, there is a degree of customizability about how you engage with this gameplay, but there is depth and skill involved for players who want it. And that's part two, the real-time battle gameplay. Now, hopefully I'm not making this too confusing by using both parts and levels in the same section. Anyway, the third and final part is the campaign map. Now, you could view this as its own standalone game, and it would have enough depth to stand alone. On the campaign map, you recruit units, move armies, construct buildings, level up lords and heroes, equip items, engage in diplomacy, research technology, make choices during events, utilize faction and lord specific mechanics, and just zoom all the way out to admire the vastness of your empire while planning out who next to crush beneath your army's feet. It is, at its core, a fairly standard turn-based 4x game where much of the enjoyment comes from making important strategic decisions to defeat any who oppose you. And it works well. There are plenty of decisions to make, usually with a respectable amount of options and where the outcomes feel suitably impactful, and you're generally rewarded for being smart. It is a solid 4x game, and if you really wanted to, you could entirely ignore and skip over the real-time battles by just making use of the auto-resolve option. But to do this would be a mistake, because the true greatness of Total War is how all these different parts come together. 
Because, yeah, the action can look visually impressive, but visuals alone don't mean much without context behind them. And, yeah, the gameplay of individual battles is fun, but if this game was just a series of battles where the only outcome of victory was unlocking the next battle, then your victories would feel pretty hollow. And, yeah, the campaign map on its own could function as a serviceable standalone game, but it's not like it really does that much to stand out against many other games of the same genre. Together, however, each individual part gives meaning to the others. And so, it's not just about winning a battle, you're also growing your empire and trying to conserve units for the next fight. And you're not just making abstract decisions on a campaign map, you're also seeing the consequences of those decisions on the battlefield down to each individual death. And, no matter how badly the campaign might be going, or how many enemies march to your gates, you do always have the opportunity to turn things around by clawing your way to victory on the battlefield through superior skill, and so on. It's this kind of interplay between these parts that provides the context and consequences needed to make each part more meaningful and enjoyable. If you want a game which does one thing and does it well, Total War may not be for you. But if you instead want something big, expansive and varied that satisfies both tactically and strategically while containing real depth and good visuals, Total War is the king and its rule is unquestioned. And that might be why the series is still going strong over 20 years later. Still, some things have changed in this time and none more noticeable than when the series said goodbye to its historical roots to instead embrace the exaggerated dark fantasy of Warhammer. As a kid, I loved Warhammer, except I couldn't actually play it, because it was expensive, and I was just a kid. So while I did play a little 40k, for Warhammer Fantasy, I mostly had to be content with just looking from afar. And that wasn't easy because if there was one thing Warhammer and 40k always excelled at, it was making kids wish they could play them. You see, in the UK, we had these games workshop stores where inside there would always be tabletops full of painted miniatures arranged in battle, and man, was that an effective way at capturing a child's imagination as were the rows and rows of colourful boxes that lined the shelves, or the artwork and images that filled the rule books. And so I used to go to these stores and read those books, and just imagine the armies and events they depicted, while always wishing I had the means to create my own battles and to see the different parts of this world brought to life. So, despite how many years may have passed, I still find it a little incredible how well Total War Warhammer makes that childhood dream of mine a reality, and it does so without requiring lots of money, or time and patience, or even other people to play with. Which is not to say that Total War Warhammer contains everything that's in the tabletop game, as there are still some factions and units the game doesn't have, but by this point, there aren't that many and with 23 different playable factions, 86 different legendary lords, and I don't know how many units because there are literally too many for me to count, it means there is a staggering amount of the Warhammer universe contained within these games, including sides you don't normally get to see, like fully realised major and minor settlements for every important faction, each with multiple variants or factions that were only mentioned in the tabletop and never got dedicated armies. And then you have to consider that every unit has a detailed model with high quality animations and sound effects, meaning the world of Warhammer has never been quite so realistic, and that Total War's core gameplay has some strong spiritual similarities to the tabletop game as both are about building the right army and using military strategy to defeat your opposition. So, in many ways, Total War was a perfect match for Warhammer, as it was able to capture its spirit and show off all its glory in a way that no other game had come close to. And Warhammer itself might also have been a perfect fit for Total War. 
After all, the Total War series had long been about historical settings with a focus on realism, but this was a curse as well as a blessing, as while historical accuracy was one of the things which drew people to the series, it also greatly limited creative assembly when it came to creating diverse units, factions and gameplay. Meanwhile, the setting of Warhammer was about as diverse a backdrop as a developer could ask for and could provide a near endless amount of distinctive units and races, all with their own strong aesthetics and identity. And unlike some other fantasy settings, Warhammer also provided a world where total war between its factions, something that's a requirement for a good total war campaign, makes complete sense within the story. So, the fantasy of Warhammer could act to complement the series by giving more freedom to creative assembly while providing something fresh for existing fans and also appealing to a whole new subset of people that might be drawn to fantasy or Warhammer in a way they weren't for historical settings. Basically, it was a match made in heaven and in May of 2016, Total War Warhammer released. And it sucked. Well, Maybe this is just my opinion. Reviewers at the time didn't share this view, and the game's Metacritic score was a marked improvement on the last big new entry into the series. But I wasn't a reviewer, I was a fan. Of Warhammer itself, but even more so of Total War. I've been playing these games since the series began with Shogun 1, and while Rome 2 had also disappointed three years earlier, I was also willing to convince myself that Rome 2 might be a one-off that it was just an overly ambitious title that was rushed out early and suffered as a result, and that Total War Warhammer would be different. But it wasn't. It was almost as buggy as Rome 2, with less ambition and many steps back from previous entries. For starters, there was only four playable factions, plus one half-assed faction used as a pre-order bonus, which was far less overall than any game before it, and did a poor job at taking advantage of the richness and diversity of the new setting. Also, on the campaign map, you could now only occupy areas that matched the faction you played as, which meant the Empire and Undead could only occupy open areas, and the Dwarfs and Greenskins could only occupy mountainous regions. This meant you were greatly limited in where you could go on the campaign map, and also that you spent most of the campaign fighting only a single enemy type, because if you play dwarfs, the only other race you'll find in mountain regions is greenskins, and so on. Also, every different lord of a faction started in the exact same area, and as you could only go in a couple directions, this also meant every campaign with a single faction felt basically exactly the same. The endgame event, the Chaos Invasion, was also poorly implemented and basically just amounted to a few big stacks of Chaos units spawning in at the top of the map. Diplomacy seemed almost entirely broken, with the AI acting in a way which never felt lore appropriate and never seemed to acknowledge what was actually happening in the campaign. The management of your economy and settlements was at an all-time low in terms of complexity and enjoyment. Auto-resolve was poorly balanced and on harder difficulties would often be far stronger than fighting battles yourself, making you feel like you were punished for not using auto-resolve. Minor settlement battles were entirely removed and settlement defences just didn't happen, by which I mean that I did not see a single one in the 177 hours I spent with the game, because the AI would always try to starve the player out rather than attack, even when attacking made more sense. This meant the different types of battle were greatly reduced, from land battles, choke point or river battles, minor settlement attacks, minor settlement defences, siege offences and siege defences, to just land battles and siege offences. And those siege offences were worse than ever due to a reduction in options and a focus on new constantly attacking and stupidly long range towers that forced you to approach every siege the same way by just rushing in your army as quickly as possible. The graphics weren't bad, but of all the things you could criticise Rome 2 for, its graphics were never one of them, and I think Warhammer 1 was probably a step down. So basically, in my opinion, Warhammer 1 was shit. Now, obviously many people did like it, but to me it represented Total War's new lowest point, and the fact that the setting had so much potential and that the concept of a Warhammer Total War had seemed so appealing 
just made what we actually got all the more disappointing. Luckily, however, the story of Total War Warhammer did not end there, and just one year after release, Warhammer 1 was a noticeably better game. Free and paid DLC had added three more factions and more than doubled the number of playable lords, while balance and bugs were continuously improved. Still, it was one more year later, with Total War Warhammer 2, and most importantly, Warhammer 2's Mortal Empires update, which combined the campaign map of the first two games, that Creative Assembly truly unlocked the setting's potential. Warhammer 2 added another handful of new factions, while also going to greater lengths to differentiate the playstyles and mechanics of each one, with even the first game factions getting revisited and greatly improved. What's more, one of the first game's worst features, the limitation of what regions each race could occupy, was removed and replaced with a much more effective and enjoyable climate suitability modifier, meaning players could finally go where they wanted. Auto-resolve was also fixed, diplomacy was improved, choke point battles were re-added, siege defences actually occurred, and the new Mortal Empires campaign map provided a much deeper sandbox with lords in vastly different starting areas to greatly improve replayability. In short, Total War Warhammer 2 was a great game, although, much like its predecessor, it also started with a rocky launch and then grew better over time as it continued to be updated. A trend Warhammer 3 would continue. Released in February of this year, Total War Warhammer 3 saw the series transition from the large and replayable Mortal Empires campaign that Warhammer 2 had built and expanded upon over many years, back to a smaller, more narrative-focused campaign called The Realm of Chaos. This was a downgrade for many players, which was a shame because this overshadowed many of the positive improvements the third game brought alongside this. These include a number of quality of life changes, many focused on UI readability, like the introduction of icons for lords and heroes on the battlefield, or detailed reinforcement information, or idle indicators on the unit bar. A useful in-game unit browser was also finally added. The diplomacy system has had a complete overhaul to expand and improve it, so that relations between factions are easier to understand and factions behave more logically. You can also give direct orders to ally factions to defend or attack certain targets, and you can even build outposts in ally settlements to unlock recruitment of allied units, meaning the benefits of making alliances are far greater and the experience of working with an ally feels much better. Certain mechanics have been expanded upon, like the control system that governs your population's happiness, which now gives gradual modifiers based on the specific level, rather than just only mattering if it reached minus 100. Balance has also been improved thanks to buffs to melee and a wound system that reduces the effectiveness of single entities after they take enough damage. How difficulty is handled has been tweaked so that there is less reliance on numerical buffs for the AI, that previously caused a number of strange interactions, like how the higher difficulties caused every enemy to have high leadership, even if they were a unit or faction that was designed around low leadership. Multiplayer campaigns now allow turns to be taken simultaneously, which is something that vastly improves the multiplayer experience and which players have been requesting for years and many thought might never happen, and lastly, there is an in-depth, several-hour-long tutorial that does a better job at teaching new players the controls and basics than anything implemented in a previous Total War game, while also telling an interesting story that sets the stage for the main campaign by introducing the world of Warhammer and its main antagonists, the Forces of Chaos. So, overall, Warhammer 3 brought enough improvements to live up to its title of sequel, and some of them in particular can make it hard to return to older titles. One of the more mixed changes, however, was the reintroduction of minor settlement battles and alterations to sieges. This was something players had been requesting for a while, and Creative Assembly had been quick to promise. But while the visuals of the new settlements and the new larger sieges are very impressive, how these affect gameplay is less so. In general, both cities and settlements often feel pretty cramped, which has the benefit of creating tactical choke points, 
but it can also make maneuvering and positioning troops very awkward, while hindering AI pathing and making certain units like artillery almost non-functional due to constant line of sight problems. The AI also has a tendency to approach both attacking and defensive settlement battles by trying to spread out, which there is plenty of room to do thanks to the larger scale of these maps, but instead of creating multiple interesting small scale battles, this instead just makes these fights more tedious as you spend so much of your time moving around and chasing after single enemy units, or just slowly moving through the enemy city to get to the few units the AI decided to position out of the way at the back somewhere. And while you're doing this, the new blockade system slows you down even further, while the new tower system slowly picks off your troops. These were another new addition, where settlements now have multiple capture points, which provide supplies over time that can then be spent to build either towers or blockades at designated points. This seems a reasonable idea, but in practice this just exacerbates other issues. I mean, marching through an enemy city takes long enough already, without having to also destroy or go around multiple barriers. And having towers constantly shooting at you just feels cheap. Meanwhile, when defending, these add little to your strategic options and work terribly with battle realism mode because battle realism locks your camera to being close to your units, which can make finding and selecting many build points with your mouse almost impossible. And also, managing supplies and finding build points in the midst of battle when you can't pause or slow the game down is just frustrating to the point where in larger battles I often just didn't bother. To top all this off, minor settlement battles also occur very frequently now, meaning if you are someone who doesn't enjoy them, you might have a hard time trying to avoid them as they are now the most common type of battle. Thankfully there is still auto resolve, and that was something I relied on heavily for these battles as they quickly grew tedious. That said, I still can't quite bring myself to hate these changes, because the maps look really good, and I also just love that there are more different battle types in the game again, even if I do find myself wanting to skip them a lot of the time. They are one of the main areas of the game that still needs improvement however, and I think this could be done if they were just simplified a little bit. For example, only allow building towers and barriers before the battle begins, while also having fewer buildings cluttering the maps, fewer capture points, entrances and pathways to overly spread things out, and have more focus by the AI on creating a few key battles, rather than just spreading out their units for the sake of it, or just running everything away as soon as you get inside the gates. As it stands, I have played this game for over 300 hours, and in that time, I have never once seen an interesting battle over a capture point, or thought that myself or the AI have made good use of the large amount of space provided by these maps. And I also think that simpler and more focused map design would make the AI easier to program. The irony is that Warhammer 2 had the opposite problem to this, with small, simple siege maps that felt overly similar. But it seems like Warhammer 3 has ended up overcompensating by going too far in the opposite direction, leaving the action too spread out and the AI too confused. Also, minor settlement battles simply occur too frequently, which could be addressed by having them only trigger if a defensive building has been constructed, or in tier 3 settlements only. So, while the intention behind both the siege changes and the reintroduction of minor settlement battles was good, this feels like one of the main areas that still requires further attention. Still, it wasn't the sieges or settlements that made Warhammer 3 seem worse than its predecessor on release. That was solely the result of the new campaign. The Realm of Chaos has some problems. The story itself is fine. In it, the Kislevite god Urson has been captured by a demon prince, and so you must force your way into the Realms of Chaos in order to rescue him, or take his power for yourself depending on your faction, all while you defend your own land from the forces of Chaos who have a nasty habit of spilling out of rifts that periodically open across the map. The problem here is that while this story and the flavour of a chaos focused campaign might be interesting enough the first time you experience it, on repeat playthroughs these elements add very little. 
Meanwhile, the mechanical implications of the campaign can feel overly restrictive as defending your land from randomly spawning rifts forces you to be very defensive and makes any actions that aren't focused on gaining the items needed to complete the story feel rather pointless. Usually, a lot of the fun of a total war game is seeing your empire grow and having the freedom to go where you please to conquer new and interesting foes, but this campaign instead moves the focus away from this. In its place is an excessive amount of fighting against the forces of chaos, which you can do by journeying into the rifts that spawn across the map to travel through each of the four actual realms of chaos where you have to collect a special item from each one. Other factions are also trying to collect these items, so it's basically a race against everyone else where you rarely need to actually fight your rivals to defeat them, and when the rifts aren't open, you basically just wait around for them to come back. When you have all four items, you can teleport away to one big final battle, and then the campaign is complete, which is a little anticlimactic. Conquering everyone who stands before you and building the greatest empire the world has ever seen, now that feels like a victory. Collecting four magic didgeridoos and then teleporting away to kill some of the same chaos units you've been killing for the entire campaign doesn't really hit the same. There are some new special battles that occur at the end of each Realm of Chaos. In these, you fight waves of enemies while gaining supplies that can be used to build defences, recruit reinforcements, or buff your units. These are alright. They do at least feel distinctive and memorable, but they also come across as overly gimmicky and take a very long time. You have to complete five of these for a single campaign, and after doing all five, I felt like I never wanted to have to do one again, because like with most gimmicks, once the novelty wears off, they start to feel like a bit of a waste of time. And really, that's the problem with the Realm of Chaos campaign. It does have some novelty, thanks to its narrative, its unique mechanics, and its strong focus on chaos, but when the novelty wears off, these factors become limitations, and compared to the Mortal Empires campaign of the previous game, there is far less diversity or replayability, with most of the game's factions and legendary lords not even being included. Now, it's worth pointing out that Warhammer 2 had a similar campaign called the Eye of the Vortex, which had similar problems, but Warhammer 2 players only had to wait one month after release for the larger and more sandbox-focused Mortal Empires campaign to be added. And while Warhammer 3 also promised a new sandbox mode with an even larger map, this time players would have to wait six months for it to be released, and when it did, it was as a beta. The problem with this situation is that the sandbox experience is the heart and soul of the game, so without it, Warhammer 3 was in trouble. And this was shown by the game's player count, which six weeks after release had fallen so far that Warhammer 2 overtook it again. This might make Warhammer 3 seem like a resounding failure. It was a worse game than its predecessor, which was reflected in its player count. It still had the same bugs and balance issues that every Total War game has seemed to ship with since Rome 2, and while Warhammer 2 needed only one month before its real campaign was added, Warhammer 3 needed six times that, and the fact this mode was now labelled as a beta suggested more problems might be to come. And when Immortal Empires did finally arrive, it did come with some problems. But it also brought the best campaign experience in Total War history. Immortal Empires is the best campaign in Total War history, but it does cheat a bit to win that title, because this isn't exactly one game. I mean, to even play Immortal Empires, you have to own all three of these games, and Immortal Empires benefits from having three games plus many DLCs worth of content all packed into a single campaign. The campaign map itself is basically the maps from each game stitched together, and it is massive, but this game also has 8 years worth of balance updates and mechanical tweaks to assist it, and it's clear that within these 8 years, Creative Assembly have learnt a lot. To see this, you just need to compare the quality of the factions in Warhammer 1 at release, 
with any of the factions or lords added more recently. The Warhammer 1 factions haven't just been forgotten either, but all of them have had some kind of update, some of which are more substantial than others, but all are better than they once were, and those that are lagging behind will likely get more attention in the future. And so, at this point, it doesn't feel like an exaggeration to say that every single faction feels completely unique. I mean, for starters, the different unit rosters go much further than just providing a palette swap and a few numerical differences. Instead, they provide completely different options and playstyles, and each comes with their own strengths and weaknesses. Some factions excel at sitting back and defending, while some focus on speed and mobility. Some overwhelm with numbers, while some focus on a small number of elite units. There are some factions that rely almost entirely on ranged options, and some factions with no ranged units at all. There are factions with leadership problems, factions that are almost unbreakable, units that are literally unbreakable, units that get angry and rampage, and factions whose units crumble to dust instead of running away. Some factions have monsters, some have artillery, some have monsters that are artillery, some have artillery on top of monsters, you get the idea. But the differences aren't limited to the battlefield. Each faction also has their own tech trees, access to different schools of magic, different building options, and their own unique campaign mechanics. And these campaign mechanics alone can create vastly different experiences. For example, most factions take settlements and build buildings, but then you come to a faction like the Wood Elves. The Wood Elves hate buildings, so instead you spend your time protecting massive trees while you travel around destroying buildings, particularly any which someone tries to place near your trees. To aid you in this, you have the ability to teleport between these ancient trees, and so you spend the campaign healing and cultivating your forests while teleporting around to deal with any threats that pop up. The Wood Elves aren't very good at building a strong economy, but they're not bad at killing other people who already have a strong economy and taking their gold. And so the more aggressive you are, the more money you make, meaning the more effectively you can defend your forests. All in all, it's very Wood Elfy. These kinds of mechanical differences do a great job at communicating the flavour and lore behind each faction, but they also make their campaigns feel distinctive, and the Wood Elves aren't the only faction like this. You have factions that tie their building mechanics into individual armies, you have factions that spread corruption over the land which damages others who move through it, you have factions that forego paying to recruit and train units and instead spawn or summon them from a limited pool. Some factions can recruit units wherever they are, some can train weaker units and upgrade them to be stronger, factions that really like fighting might get bonus units or extra armies from battle, some factions have complex political systems that influence others of the same race, some can craft powerful artifacts, some spread plague and disease, some can build hidden settlements underneath or within enemy settlements, some can enslave other factions' populations, some can enslave whole other factions, some are more difficult to explain and can't be easily summarised into one line within a YouTube video, but they still exist, and they're pretty fun. And it's not even just the factions. Even different legendary lords can bring really significant mechanics that heavily impact the campaign. Take the Skaven, a race of small, peaceful rodents famed for their cleanliness, bravery and intelligence. They can build nuclear warheads. Or at least one of their lords can, and you can use these on enemy settlements or armies, which gives you a rather handy tool to keep in your back pocket in an otherwise fantasy setting. That lord also has access to a forbidden workshop that utilises a new resource called Warp Fuel that you gain from missions and battles, and which you can spend to enhance your Skaven weapon teams and constructs. Then you have Deathmaster Snickich, leader of the assassin-focused clan Eshin. This lord has greatly increased recruitment costs, but he offsets this by having access to shadowy dealings and assassination contracts that you can take to cripple your foes or earn gold and favour from other Skaven factions. One of these actions, Plunge into Anarchy, even allows you to assassinate another faction's leader and have them be overthrown by rebels. And then we come to Frot the Unclean, whose focus is on monsters and mutations. 
Frot earns growth juice through winning battles or recycling units, which you can use to spawn batches of monsters that can be instantly recruited. You can then further enhance your creations in the flesh laboratory by injecting them with mutagens for additional bonuses, although each mutation has a chance of turning that unit unstable, which causes negative effects like periodic damage or exploding. Unstable units can be recycled for bonus growth juice, however, and so you can experiment a way to try to create the most powerful monsters possible while recycling your failures. These kinds of differences are deeply thematic, but they also add extra layers of complexity to resource management and battle strategy, and having different options like this within a single faction greatly enhances replayability. And these are just different lords. To remind you, there are 86 different lords in total, and while not all of them are on the same level as our innocent little rat men, the amount of variation they do still provide is staggering. Even the different starting locations shouldn't be underestimated. Playing as the Empire in The Empire will have you thrust into empiric politics and dealing with rapidly encroaching vampire counts, Norskans and Chaos. But if you play as Volkmar down in the vast deserts of Araby, you'd instead be surrounded by sand and skeletons. Or you can play as Wolfheart and live out your colonizing dreams in the jungles of Lustria, fighting against lizardmen, skaven, pirates, and whatever else you find down there. It's almost mind-blowing to go back and consider that Warhammer 1 shipped with only eight different lords, with each from the same faction sharing a starting location alongside significant limitations on what areas each faction can occupy. Whereas now, you can play as pretty much anyone, anywhere, and head in any direction you want. And it's this freedom and variety that makes Immortal Empires excel as this ultimate sandbox. There really is a sense that each campaign you undertake is going to provide a unique experience, and it's an experience that will be shaped by the player's actions. You see, unlike the main game campaign, or other attempts by Creative Assembly, in Immortal Empires, there's no actual storyline and your only directions are a few optional campaign objectives. And yet, by providing the player with the tools they need and then setting them free to create their own fun, each campaign is then able to generate its own narrative based on your actions. For example, here are a few of my recent campaigns. My Wood Elf campaign was surprisingly easy due to the strength of the faction, meaning I had little trouble protecting my borders and completing the normal Wood Elf objectives. Because of this, and the new and improved diplomacy, I turned the campaign into one big all-out war between the factions of order and evil by making as many alliances with good aligned factions as possible while declaring war on everyone else. I then used the ability to teleport between forests to not only protect my land, but also to proactively protect my allies, helping them grow in strength while systematically wiping out every single evil faction off the face of the map. Which I did. For all of them. Bringing peace to the world of Warhammer for, I guess, the first time. This was particularly satisfying for two reasons. The first is that Total War campaigns are long, and outside of the shorter Shogun 1 and 2, I don't remember ever wiping out every single enemy in one of these games before, which made this feel pretty good. The second was that when playing Warhammer 1 and 2, I had often wished their campaigns had provided an order vs evil world war, but this was the first time I could fully turn this into a reality and play out a campaign with this focus. In most of my other campaigns, I played on Legendary, which is the highest difficulty setting and, in addition to other modifiers, also removes your ability to manually save so that you're forced to live with every action you take and every defeat you suffer. This was new to me, as while I have played other games in the series on max difficulty before, in the past, you've always still been allowed to manually save and load, which is something I would do frequently in challenging times to protect my armies or settlements. In Warhammer 3, however, I instead learned to roll with the punches and accept consequences as they come, which can add a hell of a lot of tension to certain battles. 
For example, early in a campaign as Cafe, I was trying to take care of the local rat problem, but after taking a few of Clan Eshin's provinces and not seeing any of their armies, I suddenly got attacked by four stacks all at once. This was my main army, the one which contained my legendary lord and the few powerful units I had available this early in the campaign, which was why I thought it was safe to send it into enemy lands on its own. Now though, I was outnumbered 4 to 1 and facing a battle which would change the entire campaign. Usually, being outnumbered so heavily would be a guaranteed defeat, but Skaven units can be rather weak and their low leadership makes them liable to chain routing. And while each army can contain 20 units, meaning there were almost 80 enemy units in total, there's also a limit of 40 per side on the battlefield at a time. So I did have a chance, and thus I marched into battle with absolutely no idea whether I would win or lose, knowing this one battle would decide not only the war, but possibly the entire campaign, due to how much was at stake. And that genuine fear of failure really does make a battle more exciting. Not that the battle itself wasn't exciting already. It ended up being a constant back and forth between who had the advantage. I began by setting up on a hill and devastating the first Skaven army with my superior ranged units before the others arrived, but then the enemy reinforcements started pouring in, and they just didn't stop. Things were still going okay, however. My melee were able to hold the line in a good position atop the hill, my one cavalry unit did its best to chase routing rats to prevent them from rallying, and my wizard took full advantage of the enemy's high numbers to cause absolute devastation in areas where they ended up concentrated. And this abuse of magic was basically my main hope for victory. But while the enemy's infantry didn't prove too much trouble, they still had a legendary lord of their own on the field, the famed assassin, Deathmaster Snickich, and that little prick lived up to his reputation by picking off my wizard, which I saw happening and still wasn't quick enough to prevent. So my ace card was assassinated before my eyes, while my ranged units started to run out of ammo, and my front line took more and more damage. And still, the rats just kept coming. Luckily, my legendary lord had a healing spell, allowing them to keep fighting in the front lines despite the battle's length, and to defeat Snickich in a duel to the death. They then led a counter charge where I threw everything I had at the enemy, in the hopes that if I could just get some units to flee, they would probably trigger others to run also. And so, my last remaining men, battered and bloody, pushed into the overwhelming numbers of the enemy, with my lord at the front, and kept pushing and pushing from one side of the battlefield to the other, because I couldn't risk letting the enemy get a chance to rally, and so we pushed all the way until victory was ours. And what a victory it was. It's these types of asymmetrical battles with genuine consequences and unpredictable outcomes that provide many of the campaign's best moments, and this fight was certainly one of those. The rest of the campaign was pretty great as well, as from here I set about uniting Cafe while defending the Great Bastion from the Hordes of Chaos, only to then push out beyond the wall to rid Cafe of the Chaos threat once and for all, where I learnt that chaotic wastelands are an area of true nightmare for Cafe because they cause attrition and replenishment penalties, and Cafe have no hero or ancillary unit to buff replenishment and only a pathetic 6% from Lord skills. Anyway, rid Café of Chaos, I did. As well as those fucking ogres who kept eating my caravans. In another campaign I played as the Lizardmen, where after a long and careful campaign to forcibly remove all non-Lizardmen residents from the area to make Lustria great again, I was then surprised to find the High Elves, all of them, declared war on me. Not a problem, I thought, I can make defeating the elves the last thing I do on this campaign before retiring it, but just as I had united all lizardmen under my banner and removed all other threats from our land, 
So too, it turned out, had the High Elves on their island of Ulfuan, meaning they had no one else to focus on, and so the combined forces of Alifanar, Tyrion, Alariel, Eltharion, and the Sisters of Twilight all came after me with everything they had, and I have never seen so many stacks of enemies before in my life. The first waves of armies I sent to the shores of Ulfuan were completely decimated by the enemy's sheer numbers, and only by sending two armies at a time in a constant buddy system was I ever able to gain a foothold on the island of the elves. And even that foothold I lost several times before I finally managed to push inwards. And so I waged an all-out war against a surprisingly worthy opponent, with close fought battle after close fought battle which made for a pretty memorable way to round out the campaign. In the final campaign I want to mention, I decided not to focus on actually winning, and so I turned on the Ultimate Crisis endgame scenario, alongside Legendary Difficulty, and then set to building a Skaven Empire as Clan Mulder. This went well. My provinces were terminally bordering on losing control, and I spent the first 50 turns with a complete lack of food as my ratmen continually starved. Then, after finally stabilising my permanently sinking ship of an empire, the endgame crisis kicked in and meant enemies appeared absolutely everywhere. You see, normally a campaign would trigger one single endgame crisis after a certain amount of time. These cause a large number of enemy factions and armies to declare war on you to give you some challenge in the late game. With the ultimate crisis option enabled, however, you instead get all of the endgame crises all at once. This may not be a recommended option, but what it did achieve was to put me in the middle of an unwinnable war and challenge me to try to win it anyway. And so, my land burned, my armies died, my funds dwindled, and I was forced to do everything I possibly could to try to survive this constant onslaught. And despite thinking I didn't actually stand a chance, it turned out that when their backs are truly against the wall, Skaven are pretty fucking good. So, I holed up in my cities, taking full advantage of the overpowered Skaven towers, I made use of the Clan Mulder Growth Vat to instantly spawn armies of monsters on my borders where they were most needed. I replaced every lord that died with a new one, creating multiple armies of cheap slaves to assist my garrisons while maxing out recruitment wherever possible with whatever there was in a constant attempt to defend and retake my land piece by piece, and I also permanently ended the Great Skaven Food Crisis by plunging my empire into a perpetual state of never-ending war, where there was always enough food because I was always taking more captives. And despite me genuinely thinking my empire was doomed, it wasn't, we survived. There are a few stragglers hanging about still, but my empire is now 100% stable. The only real downside is that outside of Frot himself, I don't have a single high-level lord, because every one of my lords died, and even the ones that made it to being immortal just ended up dying multiple times. Other than that, it was an incredibly enjoyable campaign that makes me want to try the ultimate crisis again, with as wide an empire as I can build, and the endgame difficulty slider turned all the way to max. And these campaigns, alongside others, show what the strength of a true sandbox campaign really is which is that it can create varied experiences with genuine unpredictability and different challenges, all with a sense of ownership for the player that makes the events that much more meaningful. Not every campaign will be great, and not everything is well balanced right now, but if a campaign isn't enjoyable, you can always abandon it and try out something else. And if a campaign isn't balanced, that's hardly the end of the world. My Wood Elf campaign was unbalanced. It was too easy, Wood Elves are just too strong, but it was because of this lower difficulty that the campaign ended up feeling unique, as this was what allowed me to achieve something I never have before. Likewise, I played campaigns with weak factions that are obviously not fully balanced yet, and I still enjoyed the challenge provided by having to play as an underdog. 
balance will surely improve with time, and some might say it's the biggest problem with Immortal Empires currently, but I'd disagree. I don't think the fact that some factions and lords are significantly stronger than others is that much of a problem in a mostly single player game, and I think if someone wants to get the most out of a sandbox experience, then they'll always share some of the responsibility in creating the type of experience they know they'll enjoy. So if the game is too easy, turn up the difficulty. Or if the difficulty is maxed, create a handicap or unique scenario for yourself. Or if a faction you want to play as is too weak, learn to enjoy the unique challenge their weaknesses provide, or turn the difficulty down. The balance should be improved in the future, but its current unevenness doesn't seem that detrimental in the grand scheme of things. Which is not to say that there are no problems with Immortal Empires. I mean, the previously mentioned sieges and minor settlement battles could obviously still do with improvements. Also, the current endgame crises feel lazily implemented while offering little by way of a unique challenge outside the obviously not intended ultimate crisis. They can also be somewhat impractical due to the possible distances enemies might spawn from the player. A better endgame system in my eyes would be for the AI to choose one single player averse faction in the late game to become a designated rival to the player, where they would then be given a significant gold and diplomacy boost, and maybe some lessons on how to build good armies, to try to create a single enemy superpower out of the embers of the current campaign, for the player to face off against in one last war for supremacy. This might be harder to implement than just spawning in some stacks of enemies across the map, but it could feel much more natural and varied while replicating some of the success of the Shogun 2 and Three Kingdoms endgame scenarios, which were probably the best Creative Assembly has ever made. In general, I also think there is an overarching problem with the late game being too easy because of the way your economy snowballs. As it stands, there are no downsides to your empire growing outside of having more land to defend, which means that as your land grows, your incoming gold grows proportionally alongside it, and so after a certain point that incoming gold just becomes excessive, removing most of the difficulty. A better system would be that as you gain more land, penalties should be introduced to control level and tax rates in order to partially limit this snowballing effect, a bit like how each new lord you recruit increases unit upkeep. This could improve the late game balance and would also be logical as bigger empires should be less efficient to tax and harder to maintain control in. Another problem that still exists is that building options remain rather basic for most factions. This has been a problem since Warhammer 1 and it's one of the few things that hasn't improved much since. The issue is that once you get past your first couple of provinces, the decision of what to build is far too straightforward as you usually don't have any reason to build multiple copies of military buildings and there are only a small number of defensive and economic options available, meaning you will probably just build the same few buildings everywhere. The simple solution I was hoping for was that military buildings would be given greater purpose so that there was an incentive to build multiple copies of them. For example, you could have a limit on elite units where each copy of a building would increase the number the player is allowed to recruit, a bit like with heroes. A few more economic or defensive options for certain factions wouldn't hurt either, but as it stands, it is a bit disappointing how little strategy and choice there is in deciding what to build once the campaign gets going. Finally, there is still an issue with some factions needing a bit more attention, not because they are unbalanced, but because their mechanics either aren't very unique or aren't very enjoyable. This seems to be the case for some of the older factions, which haven't received any real updates in a long time, like the dwarfs, as well as a few of the newer factions which feel like they're in an incomplete state, presumably because of planned future DLC, like the Demons of Chaos. This is something I'm sure will improve with future updates, as Creative Assembly obviously loves their DLC, and they also have a great track record of improving older factions over time, but even though I have complete confidence this will be addressed in the future, 
it's still a problem right now. Lastly, there are many other potential problems players might have due to certain preferences, but it should also be acknowledged that there are many things that can be addressed through mods. For example, if you find the default camera too limiting, there is a better camera mod. If chasing after enemies in Force March without being able to engage them is annoying you, there are mods to increase movement range in controlled regions to make enemies more catchable. If you dislike Doomstacks and want more complexity to army building, there is a mod which introduces tabletop inspired unit caps. If you dislike the anti-player bias the AI shows, something which felt very apparent in the Realm of Chaos campaign, particularly with Zinch's goddamn settlement transfers, then there is a mod to remove that bias, and so on. These examples I've just mentioned are all things I have used or considered using due to issues I've had with the game, but there are plenty of other mods out there to give you a greater sense of customization over the experience, and in a sandbox game with deep replayability, a strong modding scene is a blessing that can do wonders at alleviating some of the minor problems you might have with the game. That said, it would still be greatly appreciated if Creative Assembly themselves could just include more options in the campaign settings. I mean, I love the new Legendary difficulty, but I can't see any good reason why a single save option shouldn't be possible for other difficulties as well. Or alternatively, I enjoy battle realism, but it would still be nice to at least have the option to turn it off while keeping the other legendary modifiers. I'd also love to be able to just set different difficulty parameters independently for things like control level or auto resolve difficulty or unit upkeep or leadership and so on. These options might be a bit too much for new players, but you could just hide them away in an advanced settings tab as for people who have been playing these games for a long time, like myself, I think we could handle a few more options and this would only enhance players' ability to tailor their desired experience in the way they want or to just create even more varied campaigns. So, basically, sandbox, good, mods, good, and more options, also good. Still, in a game this big, some problems are to be expected, and while there is always more that can be improved, overall, Immortal Empires is still an utter triumph. It brings the entire world of Warhammer to life, all while offering an experience of unrivaled depth, variety, and replayability. It is Total War at its exaggerated best. It is strategy games at their pinnacle in terms of production values and content, and it is addictive and life-consuming in all the right ways. So, it is a bit of a shame, then, that despite all this, it still feels incredibly difficult to recommend this game to anyone because of some of the poor decisions made by Creative Assembly. And that's the final thing I need to talk about. Sometimes I feel like there is an ongoing battle for Creative Assembly's soul, where on one side you have this clear desire to go above and beyond, to utilise the studio's many talents and funding to create an incredible gaming experience for the player. And you see this in the details, in the unique animations and the handcrafted maps, or in some of the unique faction and lord mechanics that have been added, or in the design of the original factions Creative Assembly have created. And then, on the other side, you have the corporate realities and the desire to make as much money as possible. And this is displayed in how each new game for the past nine years has seemed rushed out and released too early, or how you need to buy DLC to unlock blood effects, or how newer factions almost seem deliberately incomplete, as if to make future DLC feel like a requirement. And I guess this is just how it goes with large companies. I mean, Creative Assembly isn't the only company that tries to maximise profits, and they are still able to produce great games. That said, 
you will never be able to convince me that needing to buy three different full or near full price games just to be able to play Immortal Empires is the right decision. This is something that is simply unprecedented. People expect full priced games to be able to stand alone and even games that are updated over a long time, like MMOs, will discount or include all past expansions to allow people to experience the real game. And Immortal Empires is the real Warhammer 3. It is so much better than the Realm of Chaos campaign that it's not even worth trying to compare them. But how would most players even know this? Most people probably bought Warhammer 3, played Realm of Chaos, and then just moved on to something else, all before Immortal Empires was even released. And if their first experience wasn't that good, what reason do they have to come back? Or someone might hear that you need all three games to play the real campaign, and then just buy Warhammer 1 to see if the series is for them, and then they're wasting their time with a wholly inferior version of the same game, which would never have convinced me to buy two more sequels on its own. Or what about multiplayer? With new simultaneous turns, and apparently much rarer desyncs, multiplayer might actually be the single most improved feature of Warhammer 3, but good luck getting your friends to give the game a go if they need to buy three different games just to play with you. And the thing is, there is no reason Immortal Empires had to be gated off in this way. There is a middle ground that might even have been more profitable due to how much more popular it would have been and would have seemed much fairer, which is to allow everyone who owns Warhammer 3 to have access to Immortal Empires and then just restrict access to the factions from the past games for those who don't own them. This way, everyone can try the campaign out, and the older games would just become DLC for Warhammer 3 that players could pick and choose alongside other DLC based on what appeals to them. And there you go, a simple common sense solution that could still make money without seeming unfair or so off-putting to newcomers. I mean, it was a mistake not to handle it this way with Warhammer 2's Mortal Empires, and this time it's even more obvious, so the fact that Creative Assembly haven't done this blows my mind. They have such a good game here. It's like crack cocaine in video game form, and yet they seem to be doing everything they can do to withhold that first hit. As for the broader DLC situation, it's really not that bad, although it doesn't look that way from the outside, as the price to buy every DLC is becoming pretty insane. Still, alongside these paid DLCs, there have always been substantial free updates, and whether you buy each DLC or not, you still get to enjoy a lot of the benefits from them, as the lords, units and factions they add are all added to the campaign, regardless of whether you own them. It's just that you can't actually play as them without purchasing them. And while that might be a shame for things you really want to try, in general, there is so much content and so many lords in this game that most people will never have time to play with all of them anyway. And yet, within a single campaign, you will always fight against many different foes, and so the more variety there is to fight against, the better. This means DLC is actually a good thing even if you don't buy it. So, to me, the DLC has always felt optional and has served to make the game better whether you buy it or not. I feel it's worth pointing out that I have played these games for over 700 hours and I only actually own four pieces of DLC. The Twisted and the Twilight, which I bought for the Wood Elves, the Rise of the Tomb Kings, which I bought for the Tomb Kings, the Warriors of Chaos, which I got as a pre-order bonus for the first game, and Blood for the Blood God, which is fucking stupid, but at least it's cheap and carries over between games. So I only own a small amount of the total DLC, and yet I've never felt like I really needed more because there's just so much content in these games already. And so, excluding Blood for the Blood God, the DLC situation isn't actually that bad. And yet, when you consider the quantity of DLC alongside the fact that you need to own three games just to play Immortal Empires, it makes this questionable situation for newcomers even worse. 
And I guess that is a good representation of what Total War has become. This is such a good series of games. I was blown away the day I first played Shogun 1 and I am still impressed all these years later. There is nothing else quite like Total War out there and Warhammer 3 takes many of the series best qualities to soaring new heights. But at the same time, for years now this series has been limited by some of the questionable decisions Creative Assembly have made and nothing shows that quite so perfectly as Immortal Empires itself. Warhammer 3 shouldn't have been released as early as it was. Players shouldn't have had to wait for more than one month for Immortal Empires to be included, and access to Immortal Empires shouldn't be restricted to only players that own all three games. If you could ignore all that, this game is fantastic. But man, is that a lot to ask people to just ignore. Warhammer 3 is the final game in the Warhammer trilogy and it stands as a testament to just how much something can be improved if it gets the time and money put into it that it truly deserves. But I do have to wonder if there will ever be another game from Creative Assembly that is lucky enough to get the same. I guess time will tell, but based on the past 9 years, I have my doubts. Still. At least there is always Warhammer 3. Thank you for watching my video.